Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today. We are going to go talk about Project 2025, um, which is a terrible, terrible document um, that the far right are putting ahead. Uh, and we are going to talk a little bit about what's in this document and uh, what's going on and how we can do something about it. Um, and I, I am Briani. I am the actions coordinator for the Center for Popular Democracy, um, CPD Action, and I'll be your facilitator. And I'm going to pass it over to Lynn, um, who graciously um, invited me to do this training and uh, helped organize this training. And uh, the for Vermont Progressive... The Vermont Progressive Party is one of the hosts of this training, um, and I'm going to pass it over to Lynn to speak a little bit about what the Vermont Pro Progressive Party is. Thank you, Briani. Um, my name is Lynn Barnes, she, her. I'm um, the organizing committee chair for the Vermont Progressive Party. Um, we are a grassroots party. A we are a major party in Vermont. There are three major parties in Vermont, and um, we focus on working people's issues, social, economic- Recording in progress. And um, I really appreciate CPD Action for putting this on for us. Um, we are very interested in what we can do to stop this um, horrible document from becoming actual policy. So thank you. Thank you. And then I'll pass it over to Allison with Rights in Democracy. Thank you, Briani. Um, so Rights in Democracy is a grassroots membership organization. We are dedicated to building people power to transform the fundamental structures that perpetuate injustice and prevent our communities from thriving. Um, my name is Allison Nyhart. I'm the executive director for Rights and Democracy. Uh, as I said, we're a membership organization. Our members come from all walks of life uh, and they share our vision for structural transformation through a multi-tactical strategy of base building, uh, popular education, like tonight's uh, event, policy advocacy and electoral engagement. Um, we've recently launched a housing justice campaign focused on tenant protections and addressing the housing crisis in Vermont. Um, and we invite you to get involved in our work by visiting radmovement.org, where you can sign up for email updates and become a sustaining member. Um, feel free to send me a message in the chat or email me uh, at allison at radmovement. If you'd like to learn more, I'll put my email address in the chat as well. Thanks, Brianni. Thank you, Allison. And Rights and Democracy is co-hosting this event uh, with the Vermont Progressive Party um, and the Center for Popular Democracy. Uh, well, Rights and Democracy is also an affiliate of the Center for Popular Democracy um, in Vermont. And I will get into who we are. Um, first, uh, I'm Briani, like I said, uh, Actions Coordinator for the Center for Popular Democracy. Um, this is just a little bit about where I was previously and what I've been doing. Um, I'm one of the youngest folks on staff at CPD. I was telling Lynn and Allison that I joined CPD uh, after the uh, Roe v. Wade uh, was overturned um, and I was graduating from college and I joined CPD in August of 2022. Um, and I was doing a lot of student organizing and youth organizing before joining CPD uh, with my last uh, role being with the March with March for Our Lives, which is a youth led gun violence prevention org. Um, and this is a picture of me in front of uh, my friend, Representative Maxwell Frost, who is his office uh, in, in Congress. He is the youngest member of Congress right now. He is the first. Gen Z member of Congress um, and my former boss. So I always just like to show this picture to show how my generation is now on the Hill. <laughs> 
So just a little bit about the Center for Popular Democracy before we get started. Uh, CPD is a national network of 53 community organizations. This number fluctuates. Sometimes we have 55, sometimes we have 51. But uh, we have a, a network of community orgs that are membership-based, like rights, rights and Democracy. Um, and we're working together to build a world where all of us can thrive together, uh, where people have the power to control policies, structures, and overall popular democracy that will push uh, working people to uh, being able to have more rights and more uh policies that are centered around working families. So what is Project 2025? Um, if folks have questions, comments, concerns, anything, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I am not looking at the chat right now, but I do have folks monitoring the chat and we will have a Q&A uh, option after. And when I'm done, I'll be like, hey, let's ask some questions. So if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat or you can save them till the end. And we'll make sure that we get through some of those questions. Um, and I have one of my colleagues on as well who will be helping to answer some questions at the end. Um, but if anything stands out to you, like drop it in the chat. Let's Let's make this uh interactive if there's something you're shocked about or something that maybe you know you knew about but you might have a little bit more insight on feel free to let us know in the chat um i'm going to be giving a very uh surface level overview of what this document um entails but i want everyone to know that this is just to get you uh, get you going and to get you interested and to get you some insight on what this uh, document is. But we really encourage everyone to go back and do their own research, read some of these pages word for word uh, to really understand the extent and the brevity of it. We can't get all of it into an hour training, but we can touch on a couple things that I think are the most important parts to highlight in this document so that we can make sure that we're prepared going into November. But also, uh, I continue to tell people, this is not a plan that's just for 2025. This is something that uh, the far right is planning to use for the future. This is what their, their goals and their ideas are, and they wrote them out on paper, and their goal is, pro is in 2025. Um, but we're going to try to make sure that doesn't happen, of course. Um, but this is not going to be just hap just a goal for them for next year. This is not going to be a goal for them with just one president. The one president is just going to help them achieve these goals, but they're going to continue to try to do this. This is their agenda, um, and they're letting the us know what their agenda is. So we're going to get into what they want us to know then. Uh, since they want to put it out publicly, then that means that we should all be aware of what their plans are and how we're going to combat that. Um, so what is Project 2025? It's a detailed 900 plus page blueprint developed by 100 plus conservative groups for autocracy and theocracy. So some people have said that this document is over 900 pages. Some people have said it's 880. There are many different versions of this document, but the document itself is about 900 pages. Um, and it was developed by 100 plus conservative groups with the leader of this being the Heritage Foundation. Um, and we will get into a little bit about that. So the start of Project 2025. So it's led by the Heritage Foundation, um, which is backed by the Koch family. And it aims to radically reset US domestic and foreign policy in alignment with Christian nationalist values and replaces public education with Christian religious education to also further this plan and this agenda. Um, some of the highlights of it is that it gives the next GOP president supreme powers, almost like having a king. Um, and it would also reassign uh, federal workers and replace them with folks that they have been recruiting. 
um, and those people would be uh, conservative loyalists and they would transfer authority to the private sector, uh, basically taking away federal work uh, for 50,000 people who already have those jobs. Uh, militarize the U.S. domestic law enforcement and detain and deport all undocumented immigrants. So these are some of the key key things we're going to talk about today um, and expand on today. Let's get into it. So how does this affect us, right? Um, Project 2025 is going to affect every sector of our society, right? Labor, gender, immigration, climate, our media, education, of course, healthcare, including abortions and uh, women's health and reproductive justice. Also, one of the things that would affect us directly as an organization is that many nonprofits will become illegal because of the work that we do, because of the messages that we're sending. Um, and we don't have too many people who have organized under an authoritarian, of, under an authoritarian dictatorship. So uh, nonprofits as we know it would uh, be defunded and could dissolve. If enacted, Project 2025 will create America's first dictatorship. This is something that is one of the biggest concerns when we're thinking about this document and we're thinking about what the GOP's plan is um, if they were able to get a, a, a leader in to office as the president. This would be the first thing they do, which would be our create a dictatorship. Immigration was going to be the first first thing we're targeting. So, sorry. So they would revise existing law to allow mass detention. Um, they are pushing for a single nationwide detention standard that would be codified uh, to prevent individual states from mandating that the federal government agencies. Um, adhere to widely expansive, ch ever-changing sets of standards. So um, they would do anything from allowing the flexibility to use temporary facilities like tents. Um, so putting people into mass, det mass detention centers and not even full facilities, just tents. Um, they also want to set up 100,000 new beds for detainees, militarize the border, um, which is a proposal that they're going to use the Department of Defense, um, so that's our Army, our National Guard, to help civil authorities with domestic emergencies and law enforcement support. So this militarizing the border includes um, more than just building a wall at the border. This is literally sending the National Guard to not let anybody in and to not let anybody out. Um, and to expedite detentions and deportations without warrants. So uh, there is already ICE uh, detention and deportation happening, but they would like to take away uh, the, the warrants side of things and they no longer will need that under Project 2025. They'll be able to just do mass deportations and expedite those deportations without a warrant, without any any warning. And they said they will do this, including civil arrest. Treating um, unaccompanied immigrant children like adults and sending them back alone to their home countries. We saw a lot of this happening under Trump. Um, and Project 2025 would eliminate the Flores Settlement Agreement, uh, which takes care of those unaccompanied children and remove them from the, from the custody of Health and Human Services and put them in custody of the Department of Homeland Security to then be deported uh, back to their home countries. And this would also amend uh, Section 235 of the Wilberforce Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008 to more easily deport unaccompanied children. 
and just overall reduce the rights of legal immigrants. They would like to cut off federal benefits from all America uh, from all immigrants documented or undocumented. And this is a big highlight for a lot of folks who are migrants. Um, they do not care if you have your documentation, if you have your green card, if you are a naturalized citizen, uh, they are not uh, going to respect any of that. They are going to propose cuts to their benefits immediately and then still move on to wait paths of deportation. Um, so, for example, no non-citizens would have access to public housing. Um, so if you are not born in this country, then that means that you do not have access to public housing. You do not have access to uh, WIC, TANF, um, any of the social safety net programs that many people rely on and that many families and working families specifically rely on to survive. Um, and this is including mixed status families, so folks who who are American citizens and were or were born here, and folks who are not uh, and are naturalized citizens as well. This would also reduce the number of employees whose job is to enforce civil rights rules for immigrants. So it would make it a lot easier for employers to not hire uh, migrants, even if they have their their uh, documentation. Our rights to exist. So this is directly from Project 2025. And I quote, the next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke culture warriors. This starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender identity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender awareness, gender sensitive, abortion, reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Americans of their First Amendment rights out of every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant, regulation, and piece of legislation that exists. So what does this mean? This means that the next conservative president would make it so that American civil society, so our society, would be hard against anything that has to do with DEI and with using gender awareness, such as like our pronouns or introducing yourself with your pronouns um, or using, uh, using non-gendered language and in policies and uh, basically just deleting all of those terms, um, deleting the terms DEI. Um, many places have already uh, have already experienced DEI change. Um, do in education, there has been offices of DEI uh, already shut down in in universities. Um, under under Supreme Court law, and this would only make it uh, even easier for for us to do that and for this country to do that to people who do have other sexual orientations and are part of um, marginalized communities overall. They want to delete any of that context, any of that uh, language out of all of our uh, civil society. So the project demonizes the transgender community, uh, e equating transgenderism with pornography on the very first page of this document, um, which just shows the, the hate that they are pushing. And uh, being transgender would be against the law. It would, it would be um, against the law to be transgender. And they are making these direct attacks on the LGBTQ community. They call on the Secretary of Health and Human Services to proudly state that men and women are biological realities that are crucial to the advancement of life sciences, medical care, and that married men and women are the ideal. So they would also, through all of these words, they're basically saying that gay marriage is also going to be um, illegal and that they want the Secretary of Health and Human Services to state that 
only men and women should be married to each other biologically. Um, and that is, as we, as we know, going to reverse many laws and, and many policy that people have worked so hard to, to get past in this country and rights that people have worked so hard to obtain in this country. Um, so this would set us back. Um, and they would like to also rescind regulations prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, transgender status, and sex characteristics. Um, so make it legal for people to discriminate against someone on the basis of their sexual orientation or their gender identity or even their race in their culture. It also pro proclaims that families comprised of a mother, father, and their children are the foundation of a well-ordered nation. Um, and they uh, say that under Biden's uh, Health and Human Services uh, agenda, it focuses too much on LGBTQ equity and subsidizing single motherhood and disincentivizing work and penalizing marriage. So uh, they want policies, they want policies that support the formation of stable, married, nuclear families is their language that they use. Um, basically saying that families should only be a man and a woman and their children. Um, and that is not what our law says right now. And their position is to make sure that the administration and the future administration and Health and Human Services is clearly outlining this, um, which is part of their uh, nationalist views. The previous administration uh, created the Geneva Consensus Declaration um, to propose a hierarchy of human rights, entirely excluding LGBTQI rights, sexual and reproductive rights, human rights, and all of that intention is to bring that back. Healthcare. So women uh, in, under Project 2025, women do not have the right to, per, to reproductive justice. So abortions, medica, medication abortion use would be ended almost immediately. That is actually, they have been very explicit in this document that they are going to do everything in their power to get rid of abortion across the nation. And starting with medication abortion, abortion use, we know that the far right has already made attacks on this um, by the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. And uh, even just this year, uh, with Mifepristone being a conversation of on of oral arguments with the Supreme Court as well, um, and we know that it's getting harder and harder for women to have access to abortions, especially medication abortions and uh, safe abortions at home, um, and they are going to make it incredibly difficult to access it um, across the nation. And they would revoke approval from the FDA to criminalize uh, mailing the medication. And they're also trying to enlist the United States EPA as part of their anti-abortion efforts, basically saying that you cannot mail uh, medications that could, um, that could, I don't, I'm not even going to, I don't know how to even say it in their crazy dystopian world, but uh, they're going to try to make the EPA enforce this because um, it's being mailed through uh, the USPS and they don't want us to do that. Um, and they want to make it easier for extremists to access personal information about patients' reproductive care. So uh, firewalls and stuff that doctors have to, to make sure that patients uh, information isn't sold or given out or not easy to access. They would like to make it easier for folks to have access to that so they can find out who is, you know, being prescribed birth control, what doctors are prescribing birth control or, or uh, prescribing other forms of contraception um, and or if they're even offering uh, abortion services and just overall reproductive health care. 
Project 2025 would also remove protections that the Biden administration put in place post Dobbs to protect the personal information of, re of people who receive re reproductive care. And they also plan to up in checks and balances by overriding the impartiality of the DOJ in order to misapply the Comstock Act and effectuate a national abortion ban. So um, they just would like to do an overall blanket abortion ban and they're going to use the Comstock. The, they've already told us, this is them telling us that they plan to use the Comstock Act as their way to uh, get a national abortion ban through the Supreme Court. And this is education. On the education end, and I know this is so much information, um, but this is all very, very real. And I saw a comment that had said, uh, this reads like dystopian science fiction in the chat. 100%. Um, some of these, the folks who created this, uh, it is clear that we may not all be living um, in the same country, or we are, and we need to make sure that these folks don't get into any position of power because this is very scary and it's only going to get scarier, um, unfortunately, until we get to the end of this where we could talk about what we can do. We're almost there. So education, uh, they don't believe that there's a need for cabinet level agency. So the Department of Education completely, we're going to get rid of that. They're going to they're going to say no more of that. We don't need it because this is going to be part of their plan to push their Christian nationalist agenda in education. Um, and this is also part of the whole uh, critical race theory and CRT uh, movement that's happening in the country as well. Um, that Project 2025 and the Heritage Foundation fully support. Um, and they would like to give full support of private school vouchers uh, with the complete money move to school choice. So just ending public education, only having charter schools and private schools so that they are able to push the um, education agenda that they have, which is to make sure that all uh, young people in the next generation of, of Americans will not have a, uh, a diverse education and will not have access to DEI in their schools. Um, they would also like to cut federal loan programs that help parents of college students, graduate students, and immigrants afford, afford higher education. So Pell Grants um, and a federal loans, any federal loan programs, Parent PLUS loans, um, they would like to get rid of all of that, making it extremely, extremely unaffordable and inaccessible for any uh, marginalized folks to be able to afford college and anyone who um, is not wealthy in this country would not be able to go to college. And that's another way of them uh, trying to take control of the education that we're learning. And they would also like to roll back um, all federal student loan programs and remove protections for LGBTQ plus students in schools. Um, and they would like the Secretary of Education to do this um, so that they could further push um, the this, this CRT um, movement that they're doing. They also like to dictate what students learn in higher education by disproportionately funding programs that push an ideological agenda. Um, and they would like to loosen data collection requirements for charter schools, undoing recent progress, which has made... Um, it's, which has ensured that data collection better includes transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students. So all of the services that uh, gender non-conforming students are receiving in their schools, um, they would like to undo all of that. Some other key issues uh, to highlight, um, they plan to eliminate LGBTQ rights in all federal policies and rules criminalization of transgender identity. They would also shift U.S. historic deterrence to offensive capability and missiles, nuclear, which is our nuclear defense, 
Um, they also will eliminate all DEI policies in civil rights bodies in government. So if there's an office of DEI at a school or in a state or um, on any level, they would like to eliminate all of that. They also will reset U.S. aid and foreign assistance to reflect only pro-life, anti-choice, anti-LGBTQ agenda. Um, so the point of that is they want other countries, any countries that um, do not, that reflect pro-life, they, they'll support, but anyone who is um, countries that support pro-choice um, would not be able to receive any foreign assistance from us. So a little bit on climate, um, climate, so full support for drilling and fossil fuels. They want more drilling, more use of fossil fuels. They want to bring back mining as a, a role and as a job. Um, they want to also dismantle the EPA. And I know that I said earlier that they want to use the EPA to make medical abortions illegal, um, but they also want to just get rid of it out all the way. Um, they would like it to not only dismantle the EPA, but also dismantle um, many other federal agencies that we have and that we rely on to do a lot of our regulations, like the FDA as well. Um, and they also would like the ability for businesses to exist without restrictions, um, so no protections for people. Um, this also includes uh, discrimination in the workplace um, and also, like I mentioned before, migrants, hiring migrants um, to work as well. And housing, they're proud of uh, Ben Carson's efforts to uh, defund HUD. They believe that HUD is unnecessary and that they will continue to defund and move public housing stock to the private market to privatize housing altogether. Um, so no more public housing and no more uh, any forms of, of affordable housing. So Section 8 Uh, and federal and public housing programs such as Section 8, they would also like to get rid of. Um, and justice transformation, uh, the Department of uh, uh, Homeland Security and Border Patrol would be merged and armed and operate within 100 miles of border to, con to conduct raids. Um, so they would raid and make it easy for uh, DHS to raid within 100 miles of the border. Um, and comments about unitary executive theory, allowing police to report directly to the president um, and to not have an administrative body overseeing uh, our justice departments would also happen under this. So what can we do? So let's take Let's take a quick break. I want to I want to hear some some emotions, some can we get some reactions? How are folks feeling after hearing about some of the stuff that the the far right is pushing for in this project? What are some things that are standing out to people? You can unmute your Oh yeah, Kenneth, I see you have your hand raised. Yep. Feel free to. My father was a lifelong employee, uh, lawyer with the Justice Department. And one of the big milestones in American government was the passage of the Civil Service Act, which got the spoil system done away with. By getting rid of the protections of civil servants, they can turn you know the, the government into basically a, a partisan body, which is what they want to do. Yes. Any other thoughts and feelings? You can drop it in the chat as well. Anything stand out to folks? Are folks feeling worried? Are folks feeling like 
what what is this like why why are they doing this just the continual underlying theme of christian nationalism yes that's the entire agenda is christian is pushing christian nationalism absolutely okay well i'm going to hop back into what oh here we have a question uh what are they planning to do about our huge housing shortage yes Exactly. Um, their their goal is to privatize. They want to privatize it. Um, so that will make it a lot harder for people to even be able to find housing. It's un not only is housing unaffordable, but people can't find it. We don't have they they're saying we don't have enough housing, even though we there are buildings and there is land that we could use, but this plan would make it so that um, corporate landlords and corporations can buy up the, that land and continue to privatize housing in a way that they're able to make it more and more unaffordable. Um, let's see. This has been going on for decades since Reagan. This is their dream. This is their dream. And they wrote it down on paper for us. They wrote it down in 900 pages to let us know exactly what they're going to do. And that's why we have to do something about it, because we're not going to let them just do it in our face. Um, and this reads to me as white Christian men taking back their world, pure grievance. Yes, this this is this is that it was definitely created by white Christian nationalist men. Protecting civil service is key. Perhaps unions can help here. Solidarity among workers. That's a great, great, great point, John. Absolutely. It's going to be up to working families um, and people who are in unions um, to really stand strong and to, uh, and to unite in solidarity when it comes to these, these issues, especially in civil servant, as a civil servant. Um if Trump wins, but has a Democratic Congress, can they still put this in place? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of things that that will not be able to happen right away, for sure. But there are going to be some things that are going to happen fairly quickly because of the Supreme Court uh, being like in, in the majority of far right. Um, since we have such a conservative Supreme Court, a lot of these uh, issues would be able to be easier to be to happen if we had a, a Republican president. So that's why I'm saying that it's not important for us to acknowledge this just now um, and just for November or just for entering Project 2025. But it's important that we continue to talk about this because we know that they're going to keep pushing to get that Republican president in because it's going to make it easier for them to pass a lot of these things. They're never going to stop trying to pass them. It's just going to make it easier for them to have that that Republican pawn. Uh, Trump would just be one pawn in their plan and in their cycle of how they plan to overturn um, many, many policies. They're also not just trying to get a Republican president. Uh, right now, that's their goal because it's an election year, but we also know that they are pushing their own civil servant trainings um, and that they have their own uh, training uh, and development course that they're using to get uh, many young adults, uh, many young white males, um, they're targeting them to get them to join um, this civil servant uh, thing that they're calling it, um, and that those folks will become the next civil servants and will help overturn a lot of these agencies and help dissolve a lot of agencies, but also will be able to do some of these things on a local level and on a state level. Um, so it's important that we we win in November, but it's also important that we win our, our state and local races as well, because there's people who believe in this rhetoric 
in every single state. They're not just voting for the president. They're also going to be voting for our board of ed. They're going to be voting for our city councils. And those are the people who are in charge of our uh, policing budgets and in charge of our, our education and our teachers. Um, so this is going to last for quite a while. So we need to make sure we're ready and we're prepared. Um, I also see uh, where will they build all the jails and prisons they'll need and how do they intend to pay for those tax dollars? Um, they plan to also, I in here, they said that they don't even necessarily want to build jails and prisons. They want to, one, get you out. They want to get immigrants out. They want to get them out as quick as possible. So deportation is number one, right? But they also are just going to set up tents. So I know during Trump's, uh, we all saw during Trump's uh, candidacy, we saw that he was just putting up more tents and they had these makeshift uh, encampments of tents um, where people were, you know, under very harsh circumstances in the cold or in the extreme heat. And they were just putting, setting them up in the middle of deserts and in the middle of, of, of areas, just open fields. And that's what they plan to do more and more of. There's just going to be tent cities everywhere that are controlled by ICE that they're going to be calling detention centers. But in reality, they're just inhumane conditions and putting people to just live outside. Um, and these plans are already being implemented at the local level. Absolutely. Um, and... Oh, it's happening in Vermont. So I I totally, totally can understand that. I think it's happening in many states, but it's in, that's unfortunate that it's also happening in Vermont. Um, Allison says, seems like we will be able to reference this document for years to come because it is so rich with laying out their explicit plan. It's proof that we're not just paranoid. They literally want to do the most extreme, terrible things that the majority of Americans don't want, 100%. Um, Project 2025 is obviously a huge threat to democracy to the extent that we have ever had democracy in this country. Snaps, yes. Um, but how do we move from defending democracy to actively building for social justice? My fear is that there is no corresponding template or even vision for the left. So we will continue to continue slowly losing as we have been for the last 50 plus years. Yes, that's so real. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm about to get back into just my last two slides um, on what we can do. But also, don't forget, the National Socialists created a shadow government in Germany during 20s and 30s prior to gaining power in 1933. They were ready to go on day one. Yes. That is such a great point to make. Um, and I'm going to just share my last two slides to tell y'all a little bit about what we can do. So hosting some community education and mobilization, right? So we want to sound the alarm about Project 2025. We want to tell as many people as we possibly can about it. We want people, we want to tell our neighbors about it. We want to continue to have trainings like this. We want to make sure that we're joining organizations um, that are talking about this and are centering uh, Project 2025 and the far right's agenda on all of these things. Um, and just making sure that we're uplifting any videos, social media posts. Um, there are lots and lots of ways that people have broke down this blueprint now. And there's so many different um, sort resources that provide more breakdowns on, on Project 2025. Um, and also to just make sure that we're engaging in strategy sessions. How can we inform each other? Um, is there a concern that someone maybe has um, that they may not know about Project 2025, but, you know, they have a child in a school that is um, trying to push the CRT agenda um, and that is really close to them. And you can tell them about how in Project 2025, 
the far right has a whole plan to get that accomplished. Um, we also want to make sure that we're mobilizing uh, target communities, including swing state voters and folks um, who are in swing states. We want to make sure that we're supporting those states, even the states that right now are kind of like purple. Um, I know that I'll be doing some like phone banking in uh, North Carolina and Pennsylvania, states that we know um, we can win and that we just need to make sure that we're just doing a, a lot of the extra work and doing some of the extra legwork this year to make sure that we're able to win those states um, that we may have been on the cusp of winning um, in 2020. And to develop and provide educational tools, Um, and just a range of messaging and just doing outreach, just talking about this, this document is going to be one of the main ways that we can combat uh, the far right's agenda. And we want to also host uh, town halls, webinars, working groups, identify proactive steps, targets to fight this agenda. We also want to develop proactive mini blueprints for action uh, to counter key attacks of Project 2025. So one of the things that I do um, is Bird Dog Nation. I'm going to plug us in. Um, I uh, organize our bird dogging program at CPD, and we encourage folks to go out and to bird dog um, individuals who we know already are supporting the Project 2025 agenda. We support people bird dogging um, the Harlan Crows and uh, the different folks who are in the behind the scenes of a lot of this project being um, executed um, on the Supreme Court level, on, on a, a government level. Um, and we want to make sure that folks know that that is an option of direct activism. And we want to make sure that we're engaging in direct activism and that we're uh, really just talking about this so widely and also making sure that we're Um, I guess the right word is exposing um, this project and exposing what the far right's plan is to get this project accomplished. Um, and one way we can do that is by going directly to the people who we know are aiding uh, this project and are aiding the, the Heritage Foundation. And then we want to just make sure that we're developing plans, right? So plan A is uh, do we all can inform and mobilize the public um, about, pro about Project 2025 and help Dems win in November? That is what we really, really need to be doing, right? Um, this is definitely a plan that we're going to use, like I said, throughout this year, but also going into 2025, going into midterms, going into um, our next presidential election, that this is the plan that's not going to just end. Um, and plan B is to prepare vulnerable communities and the American public to live under dictatorship um, and to plan for it. So this is another, this is a, this is the bad plan. This is if all, if all doesn't go well in November for us and uh, Donald Trump was to win in November, um, we want people to know about this, this project 2025 and this plan well before November. We need them to know about it right now because we, you know, we want to win, we hope to win, we will, we're manifesting that we're going to win in November, but we never know. You never know what's gonna happen. We still have a long way to go until we get to November. And even after November, Uh, Donald Trump and his supporters have already said that they're not going to accept the election results, no matter like if Kamala Harris wins. Um, so we need to be prepared for all that they are planning to do, whether she wins or whether she does not win. Um, so we want to be proactive. We want to identify what possible losses we might have and actions that we can take to mitigate any future harms. Um, so this means also voting in our local elections and making sure that um, we are going to be having the right people in office in a state and local level so that these changes can't happen as rapidly. We have people who can help prevent some of these things and to help mitigate some of these harms. We want to make sure we're seeking out, bringing forward, 
and promoting intersectional leadership. Um, so that means, again, pushing forward organizations like RAD and supporting organizations like the Vermont Progressive Party um, and making sure that we're engaging with folks and continuing to spread their messaging um, so that we can have more lessons from our movements and be able to also and continue to engage in our movement and to push our movements forward. And then lastly, if Harris wins, there is still work to do, right? We want Harris to win because that is our best bet right now at, at preserving our democracy. At the bit, very least, we, we want to at least preserve what we have. We're not saying that she's going to make our democracy better. We're just saying that we need her to preserve our democracy. Um, and we know that we will still have work to do um, because we'll still not only have to apply pressure on her um, to make sure that we are pushing for a social justice agenda. That was one of the things mentioned in the chat. How do we push more social justice? How do we push for greater, for asking for more? How do we just, you know, require more? And with Harrison office, we need to ask for more because the far right is only gonna get stronger and they're only going to get more fired up if they lose um, because we know they're sore losers. And uh, we need to make sure that we're pushing Harris to codify Roe. We're pushing Harris to do all of these things that will create protections for us and for the future and not just for the next four years. Um, and the right wing extremists will not stop. So we need to dis discuss a long term uh, progressive fight back. And uh, that's what these spaces are for. And it's going to be really important that once we get over this hump in November, that we're still having these spaces, we're still organizing these conversations, we're still talking about what the far right's plan is and still exposing right-wing extremists in organizations like uh, the Heritage Foundation and continuing to apply pressure to those organizations and to shed light on all of the harm that they are uh, trying to create and that they have already created. And thank you so much. I ended with three minutes to spare. Um, and I just wanted to give my contact information as well um, here and feel free to uh, take a picture or anything. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, our website is on here as well. Um, you'll also be getting a follow-up email from me, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I'll be plugging some of uh, uh, Rights and Democracy, the Vermont Progressive Party, and some of our Bird Dog Nation stuff um, so that we can get all of you more involved if you're not already. And yes, let's connect. Let me know if you have um, another group that you're a part of that you think would benefit from this training, or if you would like to request another training. I also do bird dog trainings um, and lobby trainings as well. So feel free to reach out to us at any time at CPD, and we'd love to uh, to continue to spread this, uh, this training and, and this message as much as we can um, as we lead up to November. And if folks have any questions, I am on for, I got a couple minutes, um, and I have my colleague also on here, Jen Flynn Walker, um, who is uh, going to also be able to answer some questions. And she is definitely like the Project 2025, uh, like aficionado <laughs> for real, because Everything I've learned about this project, I've learned from her. Um, so yeah, let us know if you have any questions. And I see Lynn, you have your hand, go right ahead. Yes, hi. Um, I saw there was a question in chat um, about what the what Project 2025 says about unions. Is there anything that we should know about that? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, project, can you all hear me okay? Project 2025 um, is very supportive of the very poorly named right to work uh, legislation that's passing, you know, and has passed through states, um, which is anti-union legislation. Um, 
you know, Briani talked about laying off the civil service workers. Uh, they, you know, are talking about between 50,000 and 80,000 federal civil service workers who are protected by a union. And actually, this may sound familiar to you because Trump actually proposed that in the last few months when he was president. Recording stopped. And so um, he proposed it. The union, you know, went to the courts, filed an injunction, this uh, Schedule F firing of these workers so that he could appoint uh, political appointees in their place and have, you know, people who adhered to the ideology that, um, you know, the Heritage Foundation has promoted uh, was stopped. But that case has wound through the courts and um, we actually lost. Unions lost. So on day one, he can, you know, fire tens of thousands of civil service workers and he can put in place people that have been vetted. You know, Briani touched upon this. And by the way, like this training could be 10 hours long. Like we could spend a whole two hours just talking about what it says about unions. We could spend a whole two hours just talking about what it says about climate justice. We could, you know, we'd have to give the justice, they're, they're so obsessed, weirdly obsessed with um, the, the family being a mother, a father, and their biological children. It's mentioned several times throughout the document. Um, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, you know, this training, we kind of focused on, and some people have said, I wish it wasn't so heavy on the DEI, LGBTQ immigrant parts, but the th the message that we want to send to you all is that's the public part. They're going to come after and demonize the immigrant community and the LGBT, particularly TQIA communities. That's those are going to be, you know, we're going to be in the streets because they're going to they're going to round up immigrants. You're going to see raids. You know, they're going to combine. Um, I know this is a bigger answer than you wanted to just the union part, but they're going to combine uh you know, Customs and Border Patrol with the Department of Homeland Services to have a heavily militarized uh, immigrant focused, really military force that will occupy within 100 that will operate within 100 miles of the border. Now, most people in the United States actually live within 100 miles of a border. So, you know, we're talking about people in your communities in Vermont, for sure in my community in New York and Briani's community in Washington, DC, um, who, you know, we will see them out in the streets and that will actually, they're gonna replace the Department of Education and Department of Housing, which are currently cabinet level positions with this new entity. Um, and, you know, unions, they do not have support for unions. Like I am often flabbergasted that the Teamsters would not have read this part and seen that they are not going to be able to build out their union. And they're, you know, they are actively promoting uh, right to work legislation, which will diminish, destroy the enrollment in labor unions. So. And there's also other parts about striking um, that's also often included in right to work legislation, you know, uh, limiting striking, certainly limiting strikes for um, federal workers, which is already pretty limited, by the way, uh, reducing the power of the National Labor Relations Board. And we can send out the section about uh, labor unions and an and a analysis of it too. Uh, Kenneth, do you have your hand? Yeah, one thing we can do to extend popular democracy is one, make election day a, a national holiday so that everybody can be off work and go to, to vote. Secondly, abolish the electoral college and replace it with a national popular vote. Because right now it's winner take all. I mean, if you win, Pennsylvania by one vote, you get all their electoral, all their electors. So that's certain states have become totally inconsequential. Nobody bothers to campaign in them because they don't have enough electoral votes to make any difference. So I think CBD should be like CPD should be identified with abolition of a electoral college and a national holiday for voting. It's a great point. Absolutely. Um, I know that a lot of you know this, but and I'm sorry that I'm in this like dark <laughs> environment. <laughs> um, a lot of you know this, but, you know, we if if uh, if Trump 
doesn't win and Harris wins um, and we do well in the Senate, there are two pieces of legislation that have been winding their way through Congress for years, um, but we haven't been able to actually pass any policy because a simple majority of senators have not said that we can get rid of the filibuster. But if that was to happen, so that should be something that we demand, you know, Briani talked about what we can do if Harris wins, because it's not, you know, we still, we need the Freedom to Vote Act and we need the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The two of them together have to pass so that there's money to protect elections, to do things like expand, um, you know, the time that we can vote to not just election day, et cetera. Uh, Jackie? Thanks, Jennifer and Briani, so much. You know, here in Vermont, uh, people have this sense of exceptionalism. Oh, we're Vermont. We're the home of Bernie Sanders. You know, Roe v. Wade gets overturned. We we enshrined it, reproductive liberty in our constitution. So I I feel like people in Vermont have this sort of false security. And, um, and, and some parts that I read of Project 2025 just talks about, you know, the federal government withholding funds. And I, I think back when I was a kid and the drinking age change. That's what my introduction to politics. And Vermont was one of the last holdout states. And, and then they threatened, oh, we're not going to give you money for roads and this and for that and for this. And that's in Project 2025, right? That if you don't create the database or hand over the medical records, they'll withhold uh, federal funds for things like roads and bridges and blah, 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 blah. Is Absolutely. You're exactly right. So there are, those are the, the sticks. And just to show how, you know, our side, um, we often think about using sticks too. Like, you know, we want to say, if you don't expand Medicaid, you may have heard, you know, you're not going to get um, a certain amount of federal money. And then the, the Republican governors that don't want to expand Medicaid, they just say you can keep your federal money. Um, but just today, the House Republicans put in their appropriations bill on housing. Now, you have mentioned that. Um, you know, there's a housing crisis in Vermont. There's a housing crisis in New York City. There's a housing crisis in rural areas, in suburban areas, in urban areas. So just today, um, they released their, you know, the the House Appropriations Budget for THUD for Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development. And the language that they stuck in there is literally, quote, prohibit funds to be used to discriminate against Americans who support traditional marriage, unquote. Now, we don't even know what that means because we're talking about like HUD bills. I mean, obviously, it immediately calls to mind that they are trying to strip money from housing that has been created, particularly for the LGBTQ community, because while they don't discriminate against people who support traditional marriage, there could be a lawyer who would bring a case that if a housing program was for someone, you know, who was not in a, quote, traditional marriage, they obviously think that they can define traditional marriage in a different way, but they're throwing this language into everything already. And they're not even, they don't even care if the language is like based in some sort of legal, you know, precedent or, which is always what stops our side from having real teeth in a lot of legislation is that we're like, it needs to be based in something, you know, based in some kind of legal precedent, based in law. Um, so Anyway, it, it is there. I did want to just mention, um, you know, Briani mentioned bird dogging. That is one tactic that we would love to train people in. Uh, we think that, you know, Trump was it was not an accident that he mentioned Viktor Orban in the debate. Viktor Orban, actually, the the group of people that got Viktor Orban elected into power, you know, he's a dictator from Hungary, um, how they got him into power they came and they helped the Heritage Foundation not just write the Mandate for Leadership, the book that this that policy, that uh, Project 2025 is, but also set up the organizing project. And, you know, as organizers like Allison and Lynn, you know, you know, there's probably so many of you on the call. Like, it's actually a pretty impressive organizing project. They have been recruiting at state fairs for, you know, months and months and months now with a sign that just simply said, do you want to work? Such a simple message, <laughs> getting people to sign up and then putting them through a kind of, you know, master class uh, on videos where they are trained and then they vet them themselves so that they are actually ready to take these jobs 
and that they are ready to, they've already sworn allegiance that they believe in, you know, the, the, um, I'm going to call them values, but you know, they're bad values and <laughs> they're the values that are laid out in project 2025. Um, so, you know, they have built and they think that they have, you know, by election day, they're easily going to have the 50,000 workers ready to go, which means that they have hundreds of thousands of people that they have vetted and that they have organized. And so the antidote to that, the antidote is that it's not enough for us to just like take to the streets like we did, you know, after Trump was elected. We have to actually build out lasting institutions like or we have to be like really investing in organizing. We have to be part of you know, organizations that we are going to sustain over a couple of years. It can't just be like coming out to a protest with a bunch of your friends or, you know, setting up some. And I know like a lot of you are the you've been doing this. You 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 live popular democracy all the time and you're engaged. But we have to talk to other people about how that's how you keep it going is you build out the rads. You build out the the um, Vermont Independent Party. Did I say that right? Um, you build out, you know, you no, I didn't. Can progressive you, can party. You, progressive party, progressive party. Sorry. The Vermont progressive party. Is there, is the independent party terrible? Is that like the Republican thing or something? Is there, or is there, did I just make that up? There is no, there is no. Okay, great. Um, good. That's good. At least I didn't promote a terrible entity. Um, so we, you know, we have to actually like really join and strengthen these organizations. Um, and that, and that being that what happened in, in Hungary is that civil society fled, didn't really put up a fight. And we have to actually like dig in and put up a fight. So the resistance, the public resistance is incredibly important. We have to be both out in the streets and and furious that they're coming after, you know, members of our community who are LGBTQIA. We have to be furious that they're coming after immigrants and that they're engaging in raids. But we can't just do that. We also have to watch what they're doing to HUD, watch what they're doing to the Department of Education, because they can dismantle government from the inside very quickly. Are there any other questions? Hey, Jennifer, it's Allison. Um, Hi. There was a question earlier in the chat about defining bird dogging, and we saw a definition, um, but I was wondering for people who haven't heard about it or seen it in action, could you give an example of bird dogging? Yeah, sure. So bird dogging is one of my favorite tools in the advocacy toolbox, because it's when you as an individual gets to talk it's to ask a question to the decision maker, the person who can give you, who has the power to give you what you're demanding. Um, so there have been a lot of examples, successful examples of, you know, regular folks going to town halls, to fundraisers, to the library when your member of Congress is, you know, coming to speak, to the clam bakes, to the state fairs, um, and simply, you know, asking a question just a question, if you make it personal, we usually say no more than 90 seconds, have the majority of it be, about half of it be a personal story. It's you, your community. You talk about how many people are impacted. You don't throw in statistics. No one cares about that. And you um, you know, ask them a question on issues and then you prep your, you share your story with other people and then you prep your friends and your um, the community. We have a bird dog nation where we've got people all around the country. You tell them that you asked a question and the next time that Congress member or that decision maker is you know, at a public event, someone asks them the same question and we actually track the responses. So the term bird dogging comes from hunting. You know, the dog, the, you know, the hunter shoots the, I know nothing about hunting, but the dog shoot, you know, the, the hunter shoots the, the, the duck and the duck falls, but it falls like a mile away. And the dog, the bird dog gets the scent in his mouth and, or their mouth and, and goes and finds the duck. And then he does not let go of the scent and he doesn't let go of the duck until the hunter, you know, gives the command. And that's bird dogging. You're the person, you know, you're following this elected official and asking them simple questions. And in my mind, 
sometimes you see it work, you know, where people almost engage in like a protest of someone. But in my mind, at its best, this is the cornerstone of democracy. It's, you know, citizens asking where their elected stands on an issue over and over again and tries to engage in a conversation where you're actually moving them. And I act that that, you know, you will see Democrats and you will see people in Vermont fall like they will change the oh, sorry. they will change. Sorry, <laughs> um, they will change their opinions about policies and they can either go to your side or to the other side. And it will be a lot easier to go to the other side. So you have got to be sure to make sure that even the most progressive of, um, you know, of Vermont elected officials are holding strong and are not letting, you know, are truly making Vermont a safe place for reproductive health, for the LGBT community, for new immigrants. They're investing in housing. Remember that there's not going to be a lot of federal money. I mean, there's probably not going to really be any federal money. There's huge budget cuts in this House Appropriations Bill, for example. So if that's a prediction of anything to come for however, you know, and your Republican electeds will talk about how America has a housing crisis, but then they respond with a budget that has dramatic cuts that is going to build no new housing and not give any relief to people in Vermont. So um, but it's you know, it's your job to hold everybody together because it's going to be uncomfortable and people are going to want to just let it, you know, take the easy way and just let the bad policies go through. Cause if, especially if it doesn't impact them. And we're happy to do a bird dog training and take you on what we call bird dog expeditions, which is when we find, you know, a federal elected who's coming to town or coming near you, we'll get a group of people together for you and, and take you on to the town hall to the event and train you to raise your hand and ask the questions and try to move that elected official it's fun and also very serious um let's see are there any other questions The GOP wants a housing crisis, both federally and in the states. Is that to like pass money to developers or they want people to leave? What, why? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I agree. It does seem that way, but. Uh, to punish the poor, sure. You know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, that's where there's a a crack in there are you know there's some of our job will be to be a crowbar in the crack um the the republicans are not all aligned i mean there are certainly real estate developers who want federal funding to build housing and for a long time now they've been able to get a heck of a lot of federal funding if they build a tiny amount of you know kind of affordable housing right so they build their for profit, you know, middle income, high income housing with a tiny set aside that's sort of temporary set asides for uh, for what's affordable in the community. And, I, you know, they're kind of addicted to that drug. So they, it's hard to it seems like they might be aligned with us, um, you know, if there was really a push to, to get rid of HUD, for example, we're going to have to talk about some uh, different alliances that we're going to have to make if if we do poorly in the election. What's that question? Sorry. Can you explain the relationship between pro big business portions of the agenda and the Christian hetero patriarchal portions of the agenda? Uh, probably not um, fully, but you know, two areas. Housing is a good area. Um, where there's, you know, HUD's policy under Trump, which still exists, by the way, um, it's not active right now, but we didn't rescind it. So that's something that we've been asking the Biden administration before you go, Joe, to do uh, is to get rid of all public housing, just let private developers have it. Um, so that will be the big push. That was the big push under Carson. They're super proud, Secretary Carson, 
under Trump, they're super proud of the work that he was able to do to dump public housing stock. Uh, the other area where it's a huge giveaway to um, to big business is is to uh, you know charter schools um, vouchers. That's you know instead of investing in public education, it's investing in private education. Um, and you know we know private equity firms have long been in the charter school uh, world. They're in ha- private equity firms are in housing. The healthcare policy, you know, it's getting rid of Medicaid, um, getting rid of the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, we heard a little bit more details today from J.D. Vance, the vice presidential candidate, um, for uh, about what the, the Trump concept of a plan would be um, for the Affordable Care Act, for health care. And it's actually to create a pool, to create different pools. Uh, so people who are healthy and don't often go see the doctor would be in one pool and uh, people with chronic illness would be in another. Now, this has been, um, you know, you may remember if you were around for the days when we tried to create the Affordable Care Act, uh, that this does not work. What this does is this creates a dramatic, this creates a a really like, you know, not just second tier of health care for people who are chronically ill. It creates like a, you know, they're at the bottom of the barrel, the health care that they are able to access is awful um, or non-existent. And um, and actually, frankly, for the people who only go to the doctor once in their, you know, once a year, the healthcare is also severely weakened. If the problem with healthcare and the math is that it really requires all of us to be mostly in the same pool together, right? Like we need some healthy people, we need some sick people, we need in order to have the healthcare. Because if we don't have the sick people, then we won't have the um, you know, like hospitals to care for people. And then when you, anyway, so we know that there's, you know, lots of giveaways. There's also the tax policy. I mean, don't forget that one of the big, you know, Trump legislatively was fairly successful. Like he got rid, you know, we have the Trump tax cuts. We have an opportunity in 2025 to, to restore the Trump tax cuts, which were giveaways to billionaires. And they proposed a lot more of that, a lot more tax cuts for the ultra rich uh, in Project 2025. So I don't know if that answers the question. There's, you know, the the rich people um, who are supporting Project 2025, there's been some, you know, ProPublica writing and other reporters have been writing about the connection between Opus Dei um, so there is some like creepy Christian national, like religious connections, um, but also they're billionaires. Any other questions? Jennifer, there was a question about whether this, uh, the recording of the training is shareable, whether that's going to get shared afterward, do you know? Oh, we certainly can share it. Yeah. If, uh, if that's okay with you and Lynn as the co-sponsors of this shirt, it's okay with us. Um, and yes, and we can send out the slides as well. Um, there's a question in the chat. Okay. Or there's a Q and A. I don't. All right. Sorry. Q and A. Q&A. I'm on my phone, so I can't. Oh, here we go. I got it. Uh, There is a lot of questions about ID. Do you think it will matter for BIPOC if they're citizens or not? Um, Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that I totally understand the question, but um, there, in Project 2025, there is a, a lot of uh, talk about who is a citizen. And there is also um, a lot of mention, there's du- not as much direct mention, but there's a lot of language around the 14th Amendment and birthright citizenship. Um, and so you may have heard this too from a lot of rhetoric by you know Republican politicians that there is uh, that they are starting 
to talk about the 14th Amendment. They are starting to talk about birthright citizenship. And, you know, is that actually something that is codified in the Constitution? Do we actually have to have birthright citizenship? So it's not even just coming after immigrants. It's also potentially coming, deciding who is a, is a citizen and who isn't. So um, if the question is, you know, do we need to have ID or I'm not sure I understand the ID part, but I mean, obviously there's Republicans have long talked, promote things like voter ID. Um, but I don't even know that having an ID would protect you because they might just decide that you're not a citizen. And I know that that sounds insane. Like, you know, when I said it out loud, I was like, that sounds insane. I also know that at work, we have lawyers who are meeting and talking about how that's actually like something that they may try to do and that we're going to have to fight. Like, you know, like it's not, it's not clear that we, I mean, they can assert that that is in fact, uh, that the 14th amendment doesn't actually grant birthright citizenship to people, particularly if you got, you know, if the way that you came into the United States was, um, in whatever they deemed to not be the right way. Um, are there any other questions? I do, you know, if there are sections that you think that uh, there are people in your community that they'd be particularly interested in. We've done like town halls where we've like, you know, dug deeper on reproductive justice or we've, you know, dug deeper on housing. Um, and we've also worked with lots of other organizations to put those town halls together. So we would be happy to do those uh, if that's helpful. You can also, you know, I can, I can tell you who we've worked with and there's lots of, I mean, the good thing now is that there's so many resources out there around Project 2025, but. All right, well, spread the word, join an organization, strengthen your organization, um, resist if we do poorly in the election. And if we don't do poorly in the election, let's collectively get rid of the filibuster so that we can pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, also, I think we could win a lot of housing money in the budget reconciliation bill that we can win. So um, there's some real opportunities there. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, Jennifer. Thank you so Bye. much, Jennifer. Thank you. Bye.